Okay? Most people have something down in their card. All right. So what I'd like you to do is now um, pass those cards off. So people on this side, send your card that way. You guys send your card that way. Just send it. Just send it. Keep going. Your card should also should have a... Keep going. Just keep going. Keep going. Pass, pass the cards along. Pass the cards along. Oh, don't hold them. Don't hold them. Oh, never just keep passing this card back to you. Can we get the card back? There should be some more. There should be some more. There should be some lag in the system. Did you pass your card off? Yeah. Okay. We have one extra card. Who doesn't have a card? Okay, there you go. Hopefully that's not your card. Okay. All right. So um Amy, what's uh, on your card? Yes. What's on the card that you see? I know nothing about Okay, you know nothing about moves. Okay, all right, that's a, that's a good place to start. Okay, somebody else? Jim? It's funny that mine is almost the same questions that I sent the other way. Okay. Um, so I know that MRT offers a large variety of online um, free courses for free. So what's the incentive for, to offer free courses? Is it really altruistic? Is it just huge revenue? Okay, okay, great question. Um, this, is a, this really isn't a question, it's a statement. I am okay. here for exploratory learning purposes, and I'm sure how MOOCs work. Uh, but we'll be getting into online teaching in six months, and we'll be well educated and learn about it. Okay, all right, okay. So there was a question there, it's like, well, what, what is a MOOC, so. right? How does MOOC actually work, and how does a MOOC play within the online learning space in general? Okay, I'll talk a little more. Okay, what do you have there? Sure. Um, as far as we know, uh, Khan was a spark for a serious move to free online learning. Uh, and the question is, are MOOCs simply the next, uh, the, the next like, iterate, uh, iteration of public learning, or is it simply new format? Okay. okay. Couple more. Couple more. Jerome, what do you have there? They are often free and have just begun to be accepted for credit. Okay. All right, so um, let's explore some of these issues a little bit. And um, let me give you a little bit of historical background and then kind of go into um, a couple of these. Has anyone in here been enrolled in one of these high profile MOOCs? Which, where would you, where'd you take a course from? There was a game theory class in Stanford. Okay. Offered by Stanford, actually, and I took it. Okay. What, through Coursera or one of these places? Or Coursera. Through Coursera. Okay. Great. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. All right. So, just to get the, right, the, the basic definitions out there, um, a MOOC, the M is, stands for Massive. Um, the idea is that they are um, essentially addressing thousands of students. Um, open, there are no admissions requirements, no ACT scores required, right? Um, there's also, it's self-enrolled, so it's, you know, pretty much an open enrollment process, okay? Um, they're online, they are really um, in the cloud, and you know, those of you who know about technical stuff, clearly if there's 100,000 students um, on in a course, right, so you have to deal with the scenario that 100,000 people are going to be trying to download or watch a video of a professor lecturing at one time, and if you're an IT person, you know, with a couple of servers in a closet, that's a nightmarish scenario, right, so cloud computing becomes a big part of this. How do you distribute this, this load in terms of all the hits? Um, and then the C is ready for a course. And um, the, the kinds of courses that have really 
um, taken off in terms of um, the press that they've gotten, okay, um, have been the courses that are replicas of traditional courses kind of adapted and translated for the online environment. Okay. Um, and um, one of the interesting features has been that it's not purely self-paced learning. The model that seems to have really captured people's imagination actually has a fixed term. Right? So different courses run for different amounts of time. Um, and then the other features that we're very familiar with from traditional courses, having lectures, having homework, problem sets, exams, uh, TAs, these are present in these courses as well. Hey, Dennis, we just got started, just defining MOOCs. Um, so some, some basic definitions. So I've been involved in um, sort of technology-enhanced especially instruction related to science. I used to teach college physics before I came to Auburn about four years ago. You know, but I have 15 years of teaching in college physics using a lot of technology. And back in the mid-90s, um, you know, this, this methodology called peer instruction, um, which came out of the work of Eric Mazur at Harvard, um, was starting to really take root as a number of people started to realize, especially in the sciences, that lecturing to students for 50 minutes was not an effective, for most students, it was not an effective method of having them use that time in class for learning purposes. Okay. And so what started to kind of emerge was this concept of having sort of mini lectures, right? And then some of the time, so if you imagine a 50 minute class, you have about three or four or three 10 to 15 minute sort of mini lectures of a certain content within that. And then the time gaps that are left over are now used for some type of active learning exercise. At the same time, the confluence of technology, a certain technology started to emerge okay, towards the late 90s that really made this thing take off. And that was the whole clicker stuff. Wireless clickers came into being in 1999. Okay? I first used them in 1999. Um, and uh, that really now made it very easy to have some type of a formative assessment activity along with these mini lectures. You lecture for 10, 15 minutes and say, okay, all right, I just talked topic X, okay, did my students get even the basics about it? Let me ask them a question, let me quickly gather the data, and let's look at the, the histogram of the data um, and then see if that assessment data tells me anything about what they learned. So it's, it's a confluence of pedagogy and technology which is why I've kind of looked at, some, you know, I, I presented some of this in, in that fashion. Early 2000s, MIT started the Open Courseware Initiative. Okay, this is when, um, and Physics 8.01 was one of the first courses that actually went on. Um, I know that because I used the course notes. I was like, hey, I wonder what MIT, MIT people must have some really cool clicker questions, and they did, okay? And so I used to use some of those in my own teaching um, so I was following this, and so MIT decided initially it was just course notes. That's all you could get. And uh, they made it very clear this is not an MIT course. All you're getting is just the instructional materials for an MIT course. Okay. And then what started to happen is that beyond the course notes, then you start to get problem sets. Okay. Um, you know, it's MIT, so it's mainly technical areas. Okay, and then slowly you started to get into videos of lecture. Okay? I actually looked up when did YouTube actually start? Because you know, YouTube is so much part of our consciousness now, right? YouTube only started in 2005. Okay? And everyone in this room is just old enough to realize that 2005 is not yesterday. But for, of course, the teenage generation of today, 2005, well, they were you know, basically barely in diapers. So for them, YouTube's been there their whole life, their whole conscious life. Okay? But YouTube has only been around since 2005. But once YouTube came along, now you had this easy sharing platform where these videos of lectures could go viral. That whole, the, the term going viral didn't really exist until these, like, these technologies came along. Okay, so all of a sudden, my students are coming down after I lecture on something and says, Dr. Chaudhary, that lecture on the Doppler effect was terrible. This is Professor at Yale who does this way better. 
Now, a professor at Yale has been doing it way better for 20 years, but my students never knew about it because they were at, you know, whatever state university I was teaching. But now, right, these students can go there and they can watch his video and they come to class and compare how terrible I was compared to this, you know, professor at Yale and tell me straight up to my face. So I said, well, why don't you go try for admission at Yale? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, but what we could, right, so some people started to turn that around. I told them, great, you said it's a study tool, right? You obviously, you've got to guarantee yourself an A because you've now found this great source of great lectures on the Doppler effect. Okay? Which, of course, gets to the whole issue of, yes, the resources are there. And the thing that all of us str are s struggle with are our students putting the time on task necessary to take advantage of these resources. Right? So two very different things, right? Everything's available on the internet, but we only have 24 hours in a day, and we have only so much attention. Can we learn from everything? All right, the other thing that started to come about was Salman Khan. Okay, turns out is a, is a native of New Orleans. Okay, and, um, and Salman Khan started, you may know the story, he actually started, um, he was trying, to, while he was a hedge fund manager, he was actually trying to tutor one of his cousins who lived in Boston. Okay. And um, then what, what he realized is that he, they were trying to schedule like Skype session with pre-Skype, whatever the technology was. Well, Skype wasn't even around then. Um, sessions, and then it, what started to happen is that schedule-wise just wasn't working. Okay, they could not meet synchronously. So he said, okay, you know, um, what I'll do is I'll make a little video of the lesson I would have given you on this particular topic, and hey, this really cool tool called YouTube is available. Okay, and um, so I'll just upload it there. But once it was uploaded, other people discovered it, and you know, and the rest is history. Now, Khan Academy has gotten over $2 million of Gates Foundation funding. Okay, and they're building <coughs> their whole infrastructure. And many, especially high school, in the high school space, there are tons and tons of high school students who are learning their content in science and math from Khan Academy. And going back to their teachers and saying the same thing that my student said to me about the Doppler effect. Okay? A lot of teachers are turning it around also and says, hey, go use the Khan Academy to learn the content, and in class, we're going to spend our time doing problem sets, doing science labs, and all this kind of cool stuff that you can't get on YouTube. The other major contribution that the Khan Academy videos made, which has been picked up by the MOOC design, is that your videos had to be short. Okay? We're back. 8 to 12 minutes is the number that's kind of quoted out there. And notice where we're coming back to mini lectures. In a whole different way, but that the basic pedagogical um, under underpinnings, right, the psychological underpinnings of how people learn comes right back here to really thinking about the fact that how do we chunk information? Whether it's live, because this peer instruction stuff was about very, you know, live face-to-face -face classes, or whether it's on YouTube, people's attention spans are similar, probably even shorter, but with media over real people, okay? And so we're back to this, um, or reinforcing this issue of having short, snappy videos. And so then from, you know, the last few years, there's been a lot of work in this area. People have now been trying to take some of this material, the open course for material, and now what you're getting now is the concept of the MOOC, which is not just a video on, a sh on one concept, not just course notes, but an entire course packaged together. So that's kind of how I see um, some of the, the um, movements in this, this kind of space, so to speak, um, being relatively aligned, actually. I mean, um, it's been one sort of logical consequence after the other. It's not been terribly surprising to some of us who've been following this. Any questions? All right, <coughs> so what are the big names, right? Um, so Sebastian Thrun, um, who was a, um, you know, he, he was really is a, is a vice, vice president for research at some level at Google, 
and had an adjunct appointment as a research professor at Stanford. Um, and um, he was teaching a class, and then he and a guy from UVA um, actually jointly offered this AI class um, and had an enrollment, initial enrollment of about 150,000 students. Okay. Um, the success of that um, led him then to start this company called Udacity. Okay. Um, so Andrew Ng, who was at, um, was also at Stanford, and he actually was a tenure track um, professor. Um, and uh, Daphne Kohler, who was also in the, in the computer science department, um, had stuff going on in their research groups already related to some of this stuff. And then they kind of thought that, okay, we can do one better. They actually launched a nonprofit called Coursera. Actually, it's a for-profit, but uh, Coursera is really trying to keep its courses free right now. Um, and he offered a machine learning course. And the interesting numbers here, um, I actually have the completion numbers here for, for Andrew's course. 46,000 attempted the first assignment. I think well, maybe 80, 80, 60 to 80,000 signed up initially. Attempted the first assignment, but 13,000 completed the course. Okay. So suppose he even teaches a large lecture of 200 people. Okay. Um, place like Stanford, large research university, you'd probably teach a large enrollment 200 person course maybe once a year. Maybe the other, other semester you'll teach a smaller upper division course, right? It would be sort of typical for, for our engineering uh, people here. So it's 200 people a year that you're hitting in some intro course, okay? How many years would it take you to get 13,000 people to complete a course? Paul, you want to do the math on our, our back black course over there, mm -hmm. whiteboard? 200 people a year, 13,000, how many years? 65. 65 years. So, regardless of what you say, right, you could look at it also possibly that, okay, let's say 150,000 students signed up, even at 13,000, maybe they have a less than 10% completion rate. So, however you want to look at it, right, is it a failure because you have a 10% completion rate in your class, or is it a success because you taught 65 years worth of students in one year? Depends on how you want to look at it. How do you want to look at it? Because they're very quiet. Jenna, what? How do you? What, is it? A, is it a success or is it a dismal failure? Yes, you. No, I'm asking Jenna over here. She's over here. Yeah. Um, well, I, I don't know because I guess my question is like, well, what does it mean to have completed the course? Completed the course really means that they've um, done every homework assignment. Okay to some satisfactory level, which has been graded. Um, and then they have, um, in this particular case, they've actually completed and passed the final exam. And this is a Stanford level course. Okay, so um, it's a, did you find the course pretty rigorous? The one that you yes. Yeah, okay. rigorous. And you're a doctoral student in something. So completed the course, yes, it's a college level course, it's a serious course, and they completed Okay, maybe 13,000 is a pretty big number. 13,000 is a pretty big number, yeah. yeah. So do you have that many people who are succeeding in a Stanford level class? I mean, those are, that's a huge number. Like, you, you couldn't reach that. Yeah. So I, I mean, at least on some level, it's, it's definitely a success. Yes. How did they grade 46,000 signings? So most of this um, had, was machine graded. Okay, but we will look at a couple of other other models as well. Yeah, yeah. I think if you, I guess you, you may have to shift your paradigm. So if you're going to use the traditional, let's say, college course, you know, assessment <coughs> criteria, you know, if you have a, you know, a third or only a third of your class complete the entire course, that probably looked at as they, they look at the instructor and say, what are you doing wrong? Right. You know, but then so if we shift our paradigm and look at the sheer numbers we're getting. Maybe it can be looked at as a successful tool. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're very early in this game, but I mean, I think those kinds of questions are what are really, I mean, interesting about about what folks are offering us. Okay. 
So, um, you know, MIT and Harvard, of course, were caught a little bit by surprise when these guys came along. It's like, damn, what do we do? So, um, MIT, of course, had the whole MIT Open Courseware, so it had all this stuff like sitting there. Okay, so they just recently launched this thing called edX. Okay, and um, edX is supposed to compete with Coursera and Udacity. Okay, um, and um, edX has recently added Berkeley and then the UT system, Texas. That's not Tennessee. That's the UT system, the Texas system, um, <coughs> including their health people. And I think that's one. That's what they wanted out of the UT. The UT Health Sciences Center has some very advanced, you know. Research in medical areas. So, Coursera's taken the approach actually of having, I think there's 33 universities now that are actually signed up and are official partners. Udacity is taking the approach that they are the originators of the courses and courses get branded as Udacity courses as opposed to um, university courses under the brand. So Coursera courses, they'll make it very clear that you're taking a Stanford course like you did, a Stanford course with a Stanford professor, you know, from Coursera, okay? In Udacity, and we'll look at Udacity course in just a second, uh, it, the, the roots may have been Google and Stanford and Silicon Valley, but Udacity is um, basically independent, you know, they're, they're independent contractors um, in terms of getting uh, people to teach. So any of you could apply to teach Udacity. Um, the rejection rate for professors who want to teach with them is 98%. Um, because now you have to have telepresence as well as everything else. Right? Um, very interesting. Very interesting. Okay, so MIT, Harvard, um, the, the real promise here um, is that they are going to release their platform okay, <coughs> as open source. Bless you. So they, they are claiming, and I've been looking for dates, there's no dates actually announced yet, but I think they actually want to work it out because the first couple of courses are just getting launched, are this running this fall. The first two courses on edX, uh, with the edX name. And um, so, but we're hoping that within the year, okay, they will have a complete open source release of their platform, which will mean the ability to do you know, post lectures, have quizzes, have assignments, grading, discussion forums, all of the stuff, okay, all the infrastructure, all the stuff that we pay for with Canvas, for instance, and more, um, will be released as open source. Okay, so some enterprising person could then sit down, write a bunch of code, and integrate edX with Banner. And then, if we like it, then we could just say, to heck with our Canvas contract, and change LMSs, and all the faculty would kill us. So because they just did all this conversion trying to canvas, right? But that's how quickly things are changing. Right? That's how quickly things are changing. Okay, and then Stanford said, okay, well we want, you know, there's another group. Um, you know, Stanford's a very interesting, I've, I've spent a fair amount of time there with some of the CS people, and uh, every research group has um, some really, really incredible technology. So if I go to a, you know, I used to go to some of these things and between the College of Education there and the Computer Science Department, there's a lot of collaborations producing some amazing tools um, for all kinds of applications. So you go and visit, you come back, oh my god, I can use this in this class, this in that class, you know. It's really, uh, really, really incredible. But Stanford has also released something with, with their brand um, from Stanford called class to go which only has like two courses in it right now. So um, we're going to look at questions in uh, a couple of courses in just a second. We'll actually go into the environment. But my experiences, I wanted to talk about my experiences because that's where this idea for this uh, whole seminar kind of started. I did a little bit of work in um, listening to world music, which uh, was a Coursera course branded from the University of Pennsylvania. It ran for about seven weeks in the summer 2012. And so here are some of the, um, the basic features of the course. Most of these courses, because they're free, there's no textbook required. Okay. Um, so pretty much all the content is coming either from sort of freely available web sources or given by the professor as class notes. Okay. And so clearly librarians of all kinds are involved in all of this to make sure that um, you know, the appropriate uh, copyright laws and stuff are being followed. So they are, but they're citing people's work and you know, you can 
go, I guess, look it up. Um, so it's a listening to world music course. So what they've done is they've used one of those technologies we just talked about. Every listening assignment is a freely available YouTube video. Okay, so they just actually went through and looked at all the resources there are in YouTube okay, um, and made the listening assignments based on that. And then, of course, there's a long on, there's a big online discussion forum to discuss some of these assignments. Quite honestly, I did not finish this course. I did not get very far beyond the first week, um, simply because after a week, I realized that they were not going to talk about Indian music. And those of you who know my particular bias, yeah, I'm like, how can you do listening to world music and not talk about Indian music? Forget it. it can't be a very good course. <laughs> so that was where I bailed out. Okay, but I stayed on the mailing list. I stayed, you know, um, so I was getting stuff from them. And um, I, the nice thing is you can actually go back and the archived class is available to you. Okay, this is one thing, of course, that in, um, especially in Canvas, is going to be a huge problem for us. You can't go back. A student cannot go back and get the stuff from old classes, you know, unless they download it while they're doing it. This stuff is there, available. Um, so there was posting about listening assignments and then there were some written assignments, okay? Um, and then um, this is this was the first place. One of my interesting uh, things that I wanted to track was what were they going to do about grading? And I think at some point in this class there were 33,000 students in the first week. 33,000 students in the first week. So you know, I was curious. Well, how are they going to be doing grading? Um, great practice. For each assignment, they put out a rubric. And one of the first things that you actually had to do when you submitted your own assignment, so as I say, I'm supposed to write two paragraphs on such and such music, okay, uh, the music of Zimbabwe, uh, let's say, and um, then you once you submitted your assignment, the rubric became available to you to use to do two things. One is a self-assessment right away, and then you had to peer assess five peers, okay, using that rubric. Okay. Um, and what the TAs were doing is that the, the peer graded assignments that had like the highest scores, the, the TAs in the class were looking at those and trying to extract from those some lessons to share with the whole group. Yeah. So where are the TA supplies from? Are they supplied from the, I guess, the whoever the instructor of record? Correct. Okay. Yeah. So in this particular case, the TAs were UPenn doctoral students in musicology or music, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And you'll get to see one of the TAs. Because one of the things that they did that was really nice was this TA help session. Because TAs run discussion sessions, right? So then you say, okay, how is the TA going to run a discussion section for 33,000 students? Right? And there was like three TAs assigned to the class, I think. Okay? But so they came up with an interesting way of doing it. So I kind of like that. So. Um, the next course that um, I failed at was Introduction to Mathematical Thinking. Okay? So this was offered by a well-known Stanford mathematician. Um, his name is uh, Keith Devlin. Okay? And um, just, just completed, um, just like a couple of weeks ago, um, and so he, a couple of, couple of interesting twists here. Um, somebody asked a question earlier about the motivation for doing it. So Keith has actually written a book called Introduction to Mathematical Thinking. Okay. So in the back of my mind, I think one of the reasons that he did this was to actually get a lot more people interested in buying this book, which is a perfectly valid reason. If you've written a textbook, you know, then you should do it. People go on book tours, right? And they get on TV and they uh, promote their, you know, books. And, um, but what he did do is that you could actually get a free e-textbook version of this, okay, embedded within the course. So you could just, if you didn't want to pay, you could get the full content of the, of the book. But then while the course was going on, and this generated like 30 different emails that he sent to everybody, um, he worked with Kindle engineers, basically in real time while the course started. And by Four weeks into the course, they had a Kindle version of the book available for purchase. 
at the same price as the hard copy, and he's not trying to make money, this is like a 9.99 or some really reasonable price for, for this particular book. Okay. Um, and so within this course, um, one of the things that they, of course there were video lectures by the professor, okay, there were some in-video quizzes. Okay. So you're watching a video, but remember our sort of golden rule of no more than eight to 12 minutes of, of the actual content being delivered, before there's something that the student has to do. And so they've actually built some of those stop points right into the video. So the overall lecture may be a 30 minute lecture, but it breaks up with quizzes. Okay. That you can take a self-assessment quiz, to say, did I understand the material? And behind all of these courses, the ultimate goal is that if you want to cheat yourself, you know, then you shouldn't be taking this course, right? This course, these courses really, the way they're set up, are about your desire to master the material. So if you cheat on the self-assessment, then it's, yeah, like, what's the point? Okay. Um, so that, that's the, kind of a, a nice aspect of this in terms of those of us who work with undergrads who only are working for the grade and not working for mastery of content. Okay. To just get them start to think about this as they become professionals, that mastery of content is what matters, right? and not just the grade. Um, in terms of the rest of the course, a seven-week course, they had five First week didn't have a, a problem set, but then there were five weeks that had problem sets and then a final exam at the end. Um, now, the one interesting thing about the problem sets here were that these were mathematical proofs that you had to do. So they couldn't be machine graded. And so there was a lot of um, discussion and I mean this part of it I think is really exciting, but it's still very much evolving. How do you do the peer grading? They once again had um, you know, rubrics that they published for each one of the assignments, for each one of the questions. But the, the really neat thing about uh, what happened with the problem sets was the people on the discussion boards helping each other um, you know, work through the material. And you had people from age 14 to 66 with this particular um, course I know that just from the comments that they made online trying to walk through some of this stuff. Did you get a sense in that course you took what the age distribution of people were or the experience distribution? Actually, I haven't looked at the ages, but okay. <coughs> there's a great discussion forum about the course, and even the professors of the course kind of contributing to answer the questions and answer whatever you ask. Right. So what I did not ask Keith when um, this course was running. Now Stanford is actually still on, but they start very late. They're going to quarter system, so they're not going to turn a system still. Um, but what, did you have another teaching mode, right? Because clearly, um, one of these courses is going to take up your time, your entire time, at least the first time you're teaching it, even if you have assistance teaching it. Because, I mean, I can show you like a page full of, you know, emails as, things were evolving, um, you know, stuff about the Kindle, how the textbook was coming about, the peer grading, um, how this was all going to be working. Um, there were errors. It's a math, you know, I mean, how, you know, we all make errors, right? We put an exam out there and we realize, oh shoot, you know, I made a mistake in problem six. And if you're dealing with, you know, 50, 100 students, it's easy to correct. How do you correct it for like, you know, 20,000 students? So there were a lot of, a lot of emails. He actually just did email to all the people who are um, registered in it um, to take care of that. And then the final course um, that I should try to um, get my daughter to take in the summer, um, but couldn't interest her in it. But um, so I followed this course a little bit, and we're going to show you a few things from it. Uh, it's called, called Landmarks in Physics, but basically an introduction to physics course. But look at this one taught by a 2009 MIT graduate, undergraduate. Kid looks like he's like 15, but I think he's 25, but he looks, you should see the video, he looks like he's 15. Okay. The previous two courses were taught, okay, so this one, Keith Devlin, the one from University of Pennsylvania, standard kind of, you know, middle-aged, you know, fully tenured associate full professor type. Udacity, remember they're the more independent, they're just like independently developing this stuff. 
they, they say they found the best person to <coughs> teach the class, not the person with the most degrees. Huge paradigm shift here, right? Higher education as we know it has all been about go get that master's, go get that PhD, go get that postdoc, and then maybe you will get to go do a couple of years as a you know, visiting assistant professor, and then maybe you'll get that tenure track position. Now, if this guy, Andy Brown, we'll see Andy Brown in just a minute, Andy Brown can be the most popular physics professor on the planet at age 25 with just a BS from MIT. What's it say for the likes of me? Well, we've already proven that I was terrible in Doppler effect, right? That was like five years ago. So where does this go? Right? What do we tell our, you know, we have all, some of the doctoral students here who are preparing to be faculty members. Right? What does the paradigm shift mean for them? Quick, guys, get into your positions before this stuff really hits. That's, that's my, my uh, immediate advice, right? Um, so Udacity, it's, you know, we could never compete in a regular class with stuff because they went on location in Europe to shoot some of the video, okay? So it's like, okay, you want to study Galileo's, you know, remember Galileo that like, went to the top of the tower, leaning tower of Pisa, dropped two balls, and they went to Pisa, okay? It's like, okay, you want to see a Foucault pendulum? We'll go to Europe, okay? So they put a huge production budget in there, okay? Two HD cameras going so they could do all this kind of stuff. Fabulous, but no, you know, Allison Hall-based physics course could ever compete with this. So we have to think about what are we providing in the you know, Allison Parker um, you know, physics experience they're not going to get here. We really have to think about that. Um, love the in-video quizzes there as well. And actually, we're going to show you a little mock-up. And then because they were on location in Europe, they went and got these you know, um, cool Italian physicists who talked about the history of you know, how Archimedes did his originally experiments and all this kind of stuff. Um, assignments, problem sets, and then I, want, I actually want to look at a couple of these questions just um, for the way they've set it up. Right? The whole concept of final exam, um, at least the way they did it in physics, was, was really neat. Any questions at this point before I switch into, I'm going to actually go, go online and show you some stuff. But we have people going out on location, right? So, so you know, Dr. Shannon, right? He goes on location to exotic or semi-exotic places sometimes, right? Yeah. So we just need to. So he's going there already. So we just got to figure out, strap a camera on him, and have him talk about some basic stuff in agronomy and soils 1000 that we can then use back here. Right. Right. So the way Udacity, by the way, is trying to make money, is that they um, are working with employers. A lot of the, the, the physics one, I think they just did for fun. Uh, but many of their other um, topics that are in there, like um, their first course was building a search engine. Okay, what if you wanted to build your own Google search engine? Okay, um, that's a pretty typical computer science type of activity. But um, they have another one, how to build your own blog. You not just write the blog, but actually run WordPress. And if you wanted to build your own WordPress blogging platform, how would you write one from scratch as a computer science person? Um, so they are going a little bit more, should it be technical competencies? Should then somebody who's applying for a job, let's even a CS major from Auburn, they don't know how to build a search engine, most of them don't know how to write, build a blog engine either. They could now say, okay, I've taken all these CS, you know, all, this, all these theoretical courses, but now look, I have successfully completed you know, these Udacity courses and I have competencies directly on these things. Here's my code that's available. You can go to this site and check it out. And now companies are looking at that and says, okay, you've got the basics from Auburn, but I see you've done this additional stuff. I'm going to hire you over somebody who just does the degree stuff from Auburn. So that's, and they're going to charge companies money for, you know, basically being able to, so you can, as a student, you can upload your CV and resume and, and connect it to some of these companies. If you can. So it's a good model. We'll see if it works. I mean, once the venture funding runs out, we'll see. But, 
And if we think about the faculty responsibility, especially in those previous two courses, um, I'm assuming they had the blessing of their university, because if you're, if you're spending all your time, then you get bought out from that course that you were supposed to teach. Right. And provost office give grants for that. Okay. So provost office give people, you know, leave to go do on beyond special assignment. Okay. So most likely, you know, um, Keith um, Devlin was on special assignment, just kind of to teach the, you know, develop and teach this course there. You could think of it in terms of an outreach grant, right? So this is if this is an outreach activity, this could be that you're on assignment with the outreach department um, and doing that. So so people do that. Well, and the big money is about to come from Bill Gates. If you believe, if you listen to but Bill Gates made an announcement. He wants to support a nationwide <coughs> university collaboration to develop MOOCs, and the number I heard was two million dollars. So um, I think there's going to be more and more push in provost and others to try to get some of this money. I'm seriously worried there might be a push you know, from ours. We're not, I don't think we're ready, but I mean, we, but, I mean if, if the interesting thing is, of course, right, it's like a large grant. If you put some big number out there, all of a sudden people get ready very quickly. But, I, mean, I guess the other, the other part of this, right, especially with the, the world music, and I think the math thinking, he's still got some work to do. But this one, you know, having sort of sat through enough of it, a lot of the stuff is done. Okay, um, they would probably have to change up some of the listening assignments. Okay, um, but the basic course content delivery, right? The video lectures, I doubt, are going to change the next time they offer the course. Okay, so if you think in terms of time shifting, right? So maybe somebody gets a full buyout to develop the first version of this. Well, maybe the second iteration of it you can get a half buyout because now the time that you're going to have to spend is going to be on slightly different things versus that original one. Um, so, okay. So, let's look at a couple of things. Um, so since we were talking about, um, this is the landmarks in physics, they actually have opening credits, okay. You know, I will be, you know, get some stock footage, okay, I can put that together in about an hour, okay. Of course, they got original footage, you know. <laughs> it's a travel budget, really never left any limit in three locations. Looks like he's 15. In Siracusa, Italy. This course is really designed for anyone. If you have no background in physics but know a little bit of algebra, you're going to succeed in the course. In Unit 1, we're going to begin with a question that fascinated the Greeks. How big is our planet? Today, it's easy to answer that question. You can go to Google and type, what is the circumference of the Earth? But 2,000 years ago, the Greeks didn't have Google. Still, a man named Eratosthenes was able to answer this question using nothing more than some basic assumptions about the Earth and the Sun along with an understanding of geometry, trigonometry, and shadows. In this unit, we'll learn everything we need to answer this question ourselves, and in doing so, we'll learn some of the important mathematical tools that we'll be using throughout the course. By the end of this unit, you'll be able to go outside on a sunny day and estimate the circumference of the Earth yourself. Short. Before we can answer the question of what your circumference is, please. It's on auto advanced mode. Okay, short, snappy, video, right? Just a minute long, okay? Now notice, Udacity, of course, is a Google-related thing uh, because of Sebastian Thrun's connection, and these videos, they're not even hosting them on their own server. If you look in the corner, there's a YouTube button in there, okay? So these videos are actually being hosted on YouTube servers and just being you know, shown on the 
this particular web page. Um, so let me show you a couple of things. So let's actually listen to this because notice the production values on here. Okay. How would you define the production values? As we go forward, I'll ask you that question in, in another minute or so. Watch us watch this part of the video. The shape of the Earth is. Now, our Earth is a sphere. When we draw this sphere, we often include lines of latitude, which go from east to west, and the center line of latitude, which occurs at zero degrees, we call the equator. We also draw lines of longitude, which go from north to south, and are all of equal length. Now, it's a common conception that the ancient Greeks thought the Earth was flat, but this was simply not the case. The ancient Greeks knew the Earth was spherical, or at least they had good reason to believe it was. They start thinking about geometry by cataloging some of the evidence the Greeks had available to them, and deciding which pointed towards a spherical Earth. First, the Greeks knew that the Earth cast a circular shadow on the moon during a lunar eclipse. A lunar eclipse occurs when the Earth gets between the sun and the moon, and the Earth casts a shadow on the moon. The Greeks also knew. Just the interest of um, how do you find the production values? Somewhat low. Pretty cheesy, right? I mean, he's just writing on a piece of paper. He's got bad handwriting on top of that. And just, you know, you love the little ancient Greek guy with the beard. But it sells, right? I mean, it works. Because, and, and that's one of the things that the Khan Academy really demonstrated. Because Khan just had him writing. All it was was a black slate with writing appearing and his voice behind it. That was it. No fancy video. No HD 1080p. None of that stuff. Okay? Um, let's look at this, this part. They actually, there's the in-video in quiz that I talked about. Here is... Let me just back it up just a little bit. Um, but here, right in the middle of the video, so that was the what do the Greeks know, and he actually developed this too. Um, these are actually things you can click. Okay? So here we have a clicker question, essentially a multiple choice, multi-select question, where he wrote, he actually wrote things down, so you saw the development of the questions. Okay? And actually I had Paul, um, our tech person, mock up something in like less than 24 hours and we think that we can actually do this in JavaScript pretty easily, okay? Where you can select some questions, okay? Embed over the video, just, you know, a, a picture, embed some stuff and then we could actually hit submit button and it would work and I didn't do very well because I was just randomly clicking on stuff. Okay, try again. Paul, do you want to say 30 seconds or less? Easy, hard, 24, yeah. And I'll just click ahead to the link of the answer because the answer then switches back to the video. I said it could support both of these theories. I can imagine a disk casting a circular shadow on the moon. Okay, and so on and so forth. Okay, it goes through. Before I get off this course, I just want to show you the um, one of the exam questions. So introduction to the final. And if your final exams First, have a video intro, I'm making it through the course. You have learned so much. This guy's a TA. How to calculate the circumference of the Earth. How to quantify motion. How to use Newton's laws to calculate acceleration. How to keep the Netherlands dry. How to find your location at sea. How to protect tall buildings from lightning. And even a bit of special relativity. Now it's time to use what you learned and put it in practice on the final exam. This exam will have no deadline, and you can take it whenever you want. You'll get instant feedback on each question, so you can submit as many answers as you'd like, without penalty. Once you're finished with the exam, you can complete the course by going to your transcript page and clicking on the Complete Course button. You will get one of four certificates based on how many answers you get correct. The criteria for each of these certificates is below the video. Good luck on the exam. Teaching this course has been an incredible experience. 
I've been really blown away by the amount of curiosity and helpfulness that I've seen in the forums. I'd like to say thank you to Jonathan for everything he's done to make this class possible. To Grant, the editor and videographer, without him this wouldn't have happened. And of course to you for everything you've done to make this class such a success. I can't wait to see you in future Udacity classes. Good luck on the exam. So just watch the first question. It's just fun. So I was just looking at the St. Patrick's Church here in San Francisco, and I want to know, how tall is it? I think we have the skills to answer that question. So some relevant facts. Right now, my head is about one meter above the height of the camera lens, and the camera is about two meters in front of me. The church is about 90 meters behind me, and notice that the top of the church lines up perfectly with the top of my head. I want you to tell me how tall is the St. Patrick's Church and give me your answer in meters. That's it. Okay? So that same, right? Tick, tick, that same. So then, you know, they're, you know they kind of show, um, and that this is actually the answer box, okay, right in the middle, once again, with these fabulous high tech graphics, okay? Um, okay, there's your eye, you know, they, they make a few things, and then you can just actually type in the number in there. Um, I think 46 is correct. If I remember. <coughs> yes, it's a two to one ratio. So I can get one right. You got it right, okay? Um, just taking that same idea, right? So often we change modalities on students. We have, especially in science classes, fabulous, you know, in class demonstrations, this, that, and then students go to take the exam, and this is a dry piece of paper with, you know, these uh, questions on it, all in text, and, and the, the rich modality of you know, everything else that we did in class goes up. So they, they preserve that, right? Just these exciting video lectures, uh, same thing in the final exam. Let me um, switch to, okay. Um, so this is the listening to world music class. Okay, this is in Coursera. Look in the top line. Okay, this is in the Coursera class. Listening to world music, and just in the interest of time, the, the professor is not as interesting. Um, what I really liked was the teaching fellows discuss. Okay, um, actually, or let's look at the discussion forum. So this is the TA running a recitation section or a discussion section. Hi everybody, I'm Lee. I'm one of the TAs for listening to world music and um, I'm going to be appearing at the end of each class to give you a little example of how to, to model the dis dis discussion forums in, in which um, you'll, be dis you'll be talking about the issues that, will, that are raised in each class. Um, so each segment uh, at the end of each class will be fairly short, but this one will be a little bit longer because here is when I'm going to give you a bit of an idea of how um, exactly this, this should play out. So, um, so to preface all of this, uh, what I'd like to say is that um, I think it's just her sitting with a camera. Okay, you just see, right? Because she's just kind of looking off to the side. You know, watch her eyes. She's just got her notes on her laptop. Okay, but very simple to do, right? You could just grab a camera, stick it on a tripod. She's just sitting on a chair. They put, you know, in front of some kind of background, and you know, leading, helping students. This is week one. So the discussion forums are about to start, and so you know they're, they're trying to um, kind of motivate the students to you know, properly uh, participate in the discussion. Let me show you one other little clip from the introduction to mathematical thinking. Okay, but this is very doable, and so let's look at the intro to math thinking class. Uh, let me just show you actually on, on the right hand side here, by the way. Um, these are the different weeks you can see, and then different classes have different amounts, things you can download. In this particular case, there was a quiz on music history. After the class is done, because this ended back in the summer sometime, there's, a mus there's an answer key, okay? There's subtitles, if you need subtitles and text, and then if you need uh, closed captioning, the SRT is also available. So these are production, post-production things they added, and then you can actually download the video off that particular, you know, whatever that event is, uh, this particular lecture. It's all there. Okay, so if I go to my courses, so here is my other one. So these are all now archived because the class ended. Okay. Um, 
in a slightly different look because this is a Stanford class, not a UPenn class. And um, one of the nice things that they, they did here, which I think we recommend people do for their um, regular online classes, distance learning classes as well, is that they actually have a lecture zero, welcome to the course. Hello, I'm Keith Bender. Welcome to this online course on mathematical thinking. The goal of the course is to help you develop a valuable mental ability, a powerful way of thinking that people have developed over 3,000 years. The first real lecture, lecture one, will be released on Wednesday. What I want to do today is get you ready for the course and tell you a little bit about the way the course will work. I'm doing this because for most of you, this will be a very different perspective on what mathematics is. Apart from the final two lectures, there's very little mathematical content in the course, and you won't learn any new mathematical procedures. Okay, so he actually, as he goes through, there's, you know, other little pieces of text pop up in different places, okay. Well, that sounds as though it ought to be easy. Incidentally, not during one of my regular physical classes, I Pretty simple, but just telling, you know, for getting students to just kind of think about where there's a background reading section, go do that. Okay, a short video, they just put him in front of, you know, a green screen and just, you know, did a, did a back overlay. Okay. Um, where's the, uh, there was one other thing I wanted to show you guys. So here's an interesting designation you could get in this course. Okay? The issue comes up, how do you do all this grading? How? Handling all these people. So because the course has people of all different levels in it, even this course had people who were clearly knew a lot of math and some who had no clue. Okay? Um, one of the things that you could actually do then you could declare yourself to be familiar with the course contents, all have direct or have or else have direct access to somebody who is who is, okay, and they are really working as kind of you know community TAs as as the name explains to jump in and help with the discussion forms. And by being a community TA, you have a special designation. You you know when you're commenting on things, you know, multiple comments, just like multiple likes on Facebook can actually give you status updates, you know, so you're, you can be you know, ranked higher in terms of being a contributor to the class. And there's a number of those kinds of social media tools that they built in to allow people to contribute and have their contribution recognized. Okay. When we run discussion sections in classes, right, right now all of you get a zero, okay, because very little discussion is going on. But if we had a structured discussion here, right, one of the things that's very hard for us to do is track that discussion, right? So participation for discussion is important, but then how do you kind of quantify that if there's a certain amount of percentage points to be given for classroom discussion? Here, it's very clear because you can see the, not just the quantity, but if lots of people find your comments useful, okay, that will automatically kind of raise your status within the and these are the tools. The tools make them automatically available. You don't have to do extra work. In class, we have to keep track of everybody, figure out how to give them points, and so on and so forth. Here, the, the, the technology itself helps us build this. Um, so, and then right now, the course is over, and you know, so you can get your certificates if you completed it. Uh, I didn't, so I don't get a certificate. The, um, most of these courses are currently being offered sort of um, once a year, okay? Um, so this one's closed. I'm not sure when they're going to open it again. Okay, that physics one, as I said, ran from like May to July or something like that. Um, you know, don't know when it's going to happen again. But, um, you know, the courses are out there. Uh, one of the interesting developments that's happening, I think it came up as one question, is that there's at least one or two documented cases already of um, some universities actually giving people credit for completing the course and getting one of the certificates of completion for particular courses. Okay. 
And then the other thing that's happening actually at San Jose State, um, it's going to be linked to the edX class on circuits and digital electronics, is that they're going to use the class as offered on Coursera. Well, actually, it's on edX. So they're going to run the class um, as it's offered on edX. It's going to be co-scheduled with a regular face-to-face -face class okay, in the normal scheduling. Okay. But the professors and TAs and the students are all going to be in the online class together. Okay. And so the idea is that the students will get the content from the MOOC, they will be doing the problem sets from the MOOC, and the professors and TAs, who I assume are getting like teaching credit at the university for doing this, will be meeting on some regular basis with the students, sort of like a hybrid class, okay, to actually go over, have that discussion forum thing, but now the students will be guaranteed, because the students at San Jose State are actually paying money for course credit, they will be guaranteed to get the feedback from their professors and TAs on their performance. And so just to make sure that um, there are some integrity measures in there, the main thing that San Jose State professors are going to do is design the final exam. Final exam will be a proctored, homegrown kind of final exam based, I'm sure, on the course material. Okay. So this is a new kind of blend now, right? Get the content from the MOOC. Let the MOOC people come up with great questions, right? Which those of us who had to come up with great problem sets, you know how hard it is to good problem sets. Let them do that work, and then we'll do the real work of supporting the students' learning. Because we're close to the students, we're physically here, and the students can come visit our office hours. Um, and then we'll work with them towards mastery of the content, and then we'll just make sure that something like Auburn, where Auburn every course has to have a final exam, we can satisfy that, and we can just make our own final exam based on that, knowing our Auburn students, and then give them the course credit. Okay, so that's an exciting new development. Yes? So, so just for clarification, yes. the, the individuals at San Jose State, the professors and TAs, are not the instructor of the records of the... It's an edX class that comes from MIT from, yeah, okay. Anand Thakur Wall is the starter, who's the originator of edX, yes, exactly. Okay? So that's why the professors have to be in the class as well, because I'm sure it'll be a slightly different treatment of the subject matter, right? Okay. So, so again, if you're ready to be a Udacity star, send your yeah, name in. I think you should do it, yeah. yeah. I, I think Introduction to biomechanics or something. Yeah, that's right. I think that could be very popular. Other questions? Any other questions? Comments? So, I mean, what about for the liberal arts and humanities? It seems to me that this type of class is not particularly scalable in, in this situation. Because there's so much involved in terms of um, the content of the instructor, the students. I don't know, it just seems like it would be much harder. So, Kathy Davidson from uh, Duke probably the leader in the digital humanities area. Um, she is offering a MOOC on topic case, but it's, it's, it's out of Duke. It's probably through Coursera because Duke's a partner in Coursera. But look for Kathy Davis. She's actually tackling that very issue right now. Right? So that, I mean, that's why I thought the Listen to World Music was an interesting one um, because that first offering, um, they have a lot of things to work out. One of, one of which was they were expecting people to have UPenn writing skills, and most of the people in the class um, were not English native speakers. Okay. So all these people were really interested in world music from countries that where you know, they could maybe write enough for a Facebook update, but that was the limit of their English. And so now expecting to so have a rubric set up on UPenn standards, and you have this world class, really the world class, that was an issue. Plagiarism was a huge issue with that class. Right, because they people were copying and pasting out of Wikipedia their responses to certain things. So they had to make special announcements. Look, guys, this is what plagiarism is. If you've never heard the term before, right? Um, this is what's acceptable. This is what's not acceptable. Um, so there was a lot of that that had to be done at the front end. Um, but this is what is so new. Right? The first time Blackboard was used this was probably very new, 1812. This late culture gabfest about three weeks ago has okay. on a gentleman at Penn who's doing the first American poetry class in one of these environments. And I can't remember exactly what he does, but he has a lot of innovative 
ways of facilitating discussion. Culture Gap Fest that takes like three or four weeks away. Yeah, if you could send that to me, I'd appreciate that. Yeah, please, thank you. Um, I mean, I think that's that's the, the really neat part that I see about these books, that they, even if you weren't doing a book, right, they're discovering things about learning and technology and, and content that can impact our face-to-face -face classes. Throughout the country. For me, this book is more like some big guys and playing Monopoly games and shrink down the job market. So what do we, as future faculty, assistant professors, should do to adjust to this? I don't know. That's, that's the one. Repeat your question to people. They are, they are more like playing the Monopoly game. You guys know the Monopoly game. Right? It's shrinking down the job market. So for us, young, young professionals, what are we going to do to adjust to the market? Do you think jobs are going to disappear because the books are here? Will be that? Do you think there's going to be fewer jobs out there in the marketplace because of the presence of the Okay, time to cultivate skills that cannot be offered online, right? So this the stuff, the personal contact with, right? So mentoring and developing individuals beyond the content. Yeah. All the other comments? I mean, uh, somebody who just does their bachelor's degree can go out and make a physics course and be the best person to teach in this physics course and reach how many students? Well, I don't know. It depends on the number of students. Then it really comes down to just whether or not you would be the best person for that. And so on, 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 on that note, though, there's really no barrier to you getting on YouTube and making a video or going on one of these courses. There's no entry fee. There's no, there's nothing stopping anyone who wants to teach and has a passion. So in some ways, that breaks down barriers. To entry. And the, you know, right now these are free, right? But would people be willing to pay a dollar? Right? Can you sell it on iTunes store, right, for 99 cents? And if you have 100,000 people, or let's say 13,000 people, even 13,000 people. And every time you offer the course, you know, you can figure out some automated ways. And, you know, with this, you know, with, we're not sure what the infrastructure costs are, okay, because no one's really, really revealing those, right? Um, but, yeah, if I can get Andy Brown, okay, to teach physics for, I mean, how many people take physics every year, physics in, in this country? Millions, right? Everyone pays 99 cents, I could make some money. And okay. that could fund you to do research. I think the thing you have to remember is that I worked in distance learning for 14 years. Online learning exists, but it doesn't mean your face-to-face -face is going to disappear. There's still a need for your face-to-face -face classes. Um, it's just another component of that learning. So it doesn't mean that you're going to disappear. It just means it's going to change part of that learning component, not all of it. So I don't think you need to panic, but it's just something to keep your eye on. Um, as I say, like we can all move from kind of the outside perspective with, with, with your question, it seems like you could, like, it would definitely open up a lot more areas, but you'd have to learn how to change your way of teaching, I, I suppose, people in the online. Of course, it wouldn't be a problem for the people, I suppose, but I guess that would range a lot depending on where it could, it could close things, because what you're saying, you're, you're doing a monopoly illusion, but it could be open. And then people like, you know, like the Khan Academy, right? There's, there's going to be Professor Rockstar. So now we've opened up this whole new arena for, you know, right? For people to be like Rockstar professors. So that could attract more people into the professoriate. Exactly. I'm not sure. I mean, it's so new, it's hard to know where to go. I think maybe the professoriate is more than just instruction. I mean, the uh, outreach, service, um, research, and so I don't think, you know, tenure track faculty member, maybe tenure track, but faculty members in general aren't at risk of being an endangered species. And also, it may open up opportunities, especially like what San Jose State is doing. So you are getting credit for teaching a course, which you have to do relatively very little prep for. You know, you have someone else developing the, the test, you have someone else developing kind of the questions, and your, your role is more of a supervisor and facilitator, which Maybe some may maybe a better way to use your time efficiently with all the other 
responsibility given to the faculty. But the professors feel like, like in San Jose University, feel like they are downgraded because they are not actually teaching. You know, they are being more like. I think the professors of San Jose have embraced it themselves. It's not been a mandate from above, and I think that's what some people are afraid of. That administrations going to say, okay, we're going to eliminate all intro electrical engineering classes, fire all those people because they can take electrical engineering, right? We have no evidence to prove that students can learn, right? So, and Learning is developmental. The 18-year-old versus the 35-year-old working engineer learning from that are two very different things. So we, so actually, traditional places like Auburn continue to have a very, very strong role in developing the minds to deal with this kind of uh, A lot of these, a lot of on these courses, you have people, especially the, the electronic stuff, working engineers. It's like I've gotten rusty on my, you know, my basics of digital electronics. I love this course because I've forgotten all this stuff. I've like it's coming all back, you know. So they took the course 20 years ago. Now it's coming back. They really enjoy taking the class. And if those guys are available in a forum to be mentors, right, um, for the 18-year-olds who are learning this stuff, then you you have a multiplicative effect there. I think way more than just a few TAs available. Yeah. So the community aspect of this is very important. All right, guys. Yes. Any I don't know if you mentioned, how do you find the courses um, that are available right now? Do you go to one of their websites like Coursera? I mean, I've been yeah, mainly doing that. Just kind of, Coursera has quite a few online available now. They'll tell you when they're going to be offered. So Coursera, Udacity, Index is coming online. Um, or you can just let free books Google and they'll, they'll probably start. Because people are starting to now do um, Compilations of MOOCs. There's a couple of websites out there that are all about, you know, which are the best MOOCs to take kind of thing. So there's a couple of those. You know, the add-on market is, is starting. Does anyone in Auburn know your community? Not that I know of. You know, um, yeah. Um, that's partly why I wanted to have this conversation. I've, I've talked to people at the library, you know, um, in terms of open courseware type stuff because. I was thinking that we should really have an open portrait movement at Auburn because there's lots of good stuff there. Um, and then combining it with our outreach mission, I think MOOCs definitely have a role within Auburn. We've got you know, experts like Dennis over there, just, you know, whose expertise, I'll just pick on you, Dennis, if it's okay. You, because no, you are. You, you are an expert in a certain area, and that expertise, you know, traditionally we've gotten it, the extension work and the outreach work out in very sort of labor intensive, right? traveling to remote corners of Alabama ways of, of getting the information, if we can figure out how to capture that and now, you know, put Dennis in the studio and make a MOOC that's available to people, you know, for learning, then I think that would be a, you know, a huge efficiency measure and capture lots of I asked because I thought the impetus for this workshop was going to be, uh, this Gates announcement, uh, a big chunk of money is going to go to APLU, Associations for Public and Land Grant mm -hmm. Universities. So I think we're going to be hearing about this. Uh, that they're talking about it at a big meeting right now. So. Okay. Well, I'll, I will talk to the Federal office and to see if we're going to. We are involved in at least two other APLU you know, um, initiatives, but APLU is a fun place. And then we, uh, you know, they want to get all the money to fund their own infrastructure. I'm not sure how much goes to the university. They want those organizations that exist to organize people. Thanks, thanks for getting us up on this. So. All right, guys, thank you very much for coming. Yes. All right, we need accountability for our cookies, right? <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Ron. Good questions. Take your job safe. Don't worry. <laughs>
It's such a broad topic. I don't know how you could squeeze it into 10 minute increments, but I guess a whole course, you know, over, over time. You Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Always good to see you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I should meet with you probably sometime during the break. Um, Carnegie Mellon has the online learning initiative. I don't know if you've heard that. Uh, Ole Miss, the comp director there, has created a consortium of folks trying to figure out how to integrate comp into to, to the Carnegie Mellon system. Okay. And now he's to work looking into some of the Gates money to do course, uh, a MOOC okay. of, on a writing structure. We're very early on, but the, and the challenge is, as you mentioned, the grading and the, the feedback, but um, we're going to be working on it over the next year or two. We have to address the challenge, I guess. Yeah. That's all. yeah. So when, we, when I get more stuff, I'll okay. tell you. Hey, how are you doing? My student and I are going to work on this. So okay. Nice. All right. Yeah. 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 Hi. Yeah, this is Roger. Heather. Nice to meet you. Uh, I'm a graduate student. Okay. Um, I was actually, actually going to ask you a question. Um, you said that possibly we could kind of make it as like a course management system instead of like a case management system. It seems to be developing that way, you know. The biggest thing is just with the course management system is the intuition of family. Right. Because you just wake up and have a lot of things. I think that's what it was. I think that is. Yeah. But it's really interesting. It's very Okay. Interesting. I'm researching about the zones, just the apps that are, I think, in composition, and so I haven't thought of it as a cost management system yet. Um, and I think that's a fascinating way to you take it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the question is that um, somebody who takes one of these courses, is their information freely available online? Like when you sign up, does your name go out for the other 13,000 people? Well, we'll get back to you. Thanks. Thanks for having me.